Welcome to Playing Above the Line. We're a podcast that takes a peek into the daily lives of community and business leaders. Each week, we uncover different views of the path to growth, leadership, and achieving success. I'm Dennis Sheeran. And I'm Alan Cave. Dennis and I are both shareholders at Hartman, Blackman, and Kilgore. We're a full-service accounting and business consulting firm. As CPAs, we've had the unique opportunity to work with many different leaders and decided we wanted a way to share their incredible stories that we've learned along the way. Today, we're joined by Molly Shim. Hailing from Kansas, she recently made her way down to Mobile, Alabama, and started her career as the assistant director of Camp Smile. Well, Dennis, another day. How are you, sir? I'm great today. We have another uh, show here to do, so we're going to milk Welcome, Molly Shim from Camp Smile. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with you guys. We'd love to know a little bit more about you. Why don't you share that? I'd be happy to. Yeah. Um, I'm very passionate about Camp Smile and all that we stand for. And so for anyone out there that hasn't heard of it, we are a camp right here in Mobile for children and adults with special needs. And we offer a residential camp, meaning that our campers get dropped off at the beginning of the week and picked up at the end of the week. And we have any camp activity that you can think of made completely accessible and adaptable. And so you're thinking archery, a ropes course, fishing, swimming, arts and crafts, all of that made to where any level of ability uh, can partake. So talk a little bit more about the participants, the campers. Tell some more about where they come from and Absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, we are for children and adults, and that Mm -hmm. makes us stand out for the fact that um, your disability doesn't end when you age out of that normal camp time frame. Right. And we want our campers to be able to come for as long as they want to participate at camp. And so our campers come from generally the Mobile, uh, South Alabama area, but we have some families that come all the way from Louisiana, northern Georgia, and some of our campers that they may have moved away from Mobile, but it's such a fond, great place in their heart that they continue to come back. And then their family may take a break and stay at the beach, or they might have someone else stay in town and they go and take a vacation. Um, Camp exists not just so that our campers can have that sense of community, but so the families can get a respite. They can get a a little bit of a break, you know, and know that their um, camper is very well loved and taken care of, even if they're not there. That's great. And I think that's a that, I mean, that's a unique setup in that you also serve adults, right? So Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's that's very cool. So is it a year long? It's residential. So when 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 does camp run? Is it just a summer thing? Is it year round? Yeah, kind absolutely. Of, that great schedule question. Work? Our schedule runs for essentially five weeks in the summer. And we say that because we have a counselor training, which is hugely important to our camp running and running as well as it does. And then we have four weeks of camp, and they're divided by age. It doesn't make sense to have our five-year-olds running around with our adults. They probably have a blast, but to make the programming a little bit more um, unique to each week. And then we have camp on the weekends as well, one in the fall and one in the spring. And we're really excited about looking to the future and seeing a chance of offering even more weekend camps. Right now, our spring camp is for our families, and so that's mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, brother, sister can all come to camp with our camper that attends. And that's for um, typical siblings, anyone who wants to come along. And it gives our campers a chance to experience camp with their families, the families to see what camp does for their camper, and the siblings to get a little bit more of attention on themselves as well. I mean, with the population that we serve, you look at a number of the, the families and, you know, if you have a child with a disability and a sibling that doesn't, a lot of the time that family might have to put more attention towards their child with a disability. And whether it's intentional or not, the child that doesn't have a disability may feel like they're not getting as much attention. And it's not something that is, I think it's ever done on purpose, but to give those uh, siblings a chance at camp to have their own counselor, to get involved, to go out and experience camp as all of our campers do. And that's true in the summer as well. For our younger ages, about 5 to 14 or so, our campers that are attending camp come with their sibling. Their sibling can be sent with them. And so that's, yeah, so that's our typical sibling. So they get their own counselor and they get to go out there and have a blast and experience camp because I would be a little jealous if I was, you know, (laughs) seven years old, my brother gets to go to camp and I'm at home with mom and dad and I'm like, okay, well, I heard that he gets to go fishing and he gets to go on a zip line and um, they're going to eat pizza every day and I have to be here, you know, not having fun. And that's just not fair. (laughs) Eating vegetables with mom and dad. Yeah, Uh, that's lame. (laughs) Yeah, right. And this is a real camp. This is, you're out, you're Absolutely. You're, you're doing the activities you normally associate with uh, with camping. Yeah, yeah. And um, what we do is a uh, challenge by choice philosophy. And what we mean by that is with, with any kid, you know, they get out for a mom and dad and they're kind of independent and they get to make their own decisions. And we want our campers to know that they have that autonomy as well. They have the option of being presented something that they probably would never get to do anywhere else. 
take our zip line, for example, it's completely adaptable. So even for our children that use chairs or use walkers and might not be able to climb the net, there's a chair that they can get in and, and swing down the zip line. And um, that's an activity that would, they would probably not be able to do if you just went to a zip line course and, you know, off the side of the road. And then our archery activity as well. So you, we have our campers that get up and they can stand up and pull back the bow and hit the target. We have one that is adaptable so that if you're using a chair and you can't get up and stand, you can still pull back and aim for the target. But with any of those activities, our campers know that they don't they don't have to do anything if they if they're really scared. But we also tell them, you want to do it, don't you? Like mom and dad aren't here. You can do this on your own. You are strong and you can do it and you are capable. And we're not going to be yet another barrier saying, no, you're too fragile or no, you can't do that. It's it's kind of scary. It's like, so what? You know, just because a child has a disability doesn't mean they don't have that sense of I can't do that until they're told that over and over again. Yeah. So your counselors are so key. And, and you talked mm-hmm. about you. Many of them or most of them, you have a week of training before the yes. others. And I'm sure you have a lot of of campers who are repeat our counselors who are repeat counselors luckily we do we do um probably not as many as we would like just because we have trained so many awesome awesome counselors through the years and right now i will say um it's a struggle to get male counselors in and the reason that our camp is unique is because we are a one-to-one ratio and we're unique because all of our families that have a child that they might have a an involved disability or they might be really afraid to be at home be away from home they know that when they send their child to Camp Smile, they are safe, they are loved, and they are cared for, and they are getting the care that they would get from their own mom or dad or grandma or whoever, whoever else might care for the child. And so with our counselors, they feel that love. And they might come into camp for one week and, and be terrified of working with a child with a disability or an adult with a disability. And then they say, can I come back again? And can I have a harder camper? I want someone that like, you know, I might have to push around in a wheelchair or they might need a little help feeding because they just, you get this feeling inside of you. And it sounds so cheesy. I'm sure that so many people feel this way, but where it shines out from you and they come back and they say, okay, I really didn't think I was going to be able to get off work, but I'm going to do one week. What's your biggest need? Or, you know, they go away to college and they come back and say, I'm not going to start my job until I worked at least one week at camp. Their siblings come, you know, the, the older sibling will say, I did Camp Smile. You have to go when you turn 16. You will love it. And then we have these generations of families. Where we have parents that came and were a counselor. And now their kids are coming. And now their, their kids are coming. Like, it's, it's incredible, the, the change it makes in the community. That's very cool. How many camp, I mean, how many campers do you serve? Yeah, absolutely. Session? So um, it's 75 a week. Our, our biggest barriers for that is just, again, making sure we have enough counselors. Have enough counselors. But we got yeah. the room, we got the food and everything else. So we um, our, our goal is always 75 a week. And unfortunately, generally, we end up with a waiting list where we have, we're at capacity for our campers and we simply cannot take any more in. And so we'll have our 75. And the reason, obviously, it's so unfortunate is because we want to have, if we could take everybody every week, we would. And we would take people back multiple weeks if they wanted to come. Right. But it's just not a possibility. And our camp is one of very few, even across the country, but especially in the region. That's am- I mean, so 75 kids a week, but that means 75 adults or, or teenage or counselors, yeah. counselors, at least. And then you've got the people who, who exactly. I guess, feed and cook and, and that kind of thing. So that's that's quite an undertaking. It really is. Yeah. And, and when people ask, you know, okay, so how many people are at camp? you got 75 campers, like whatever. It's like, no, we end up with about 300 people a week, but, you know, at, at our biggest point during the day, let's say. And so, and that's for feeding and making sure everyone's kept happy and on a schedule. And so, I mean, you're living life on a schedule. And that's not abnormal generally for a lot of individuals with disabilities because you're relying on so much from the community and from your family. But at camp, it's just a completely different aspect of it because it's a schedule, but it's the best schedule you've ever seen in your entire life. Because it's only fun stuff and then it's only great food and it's only activities at night where you're actually socializing with people that are like you. And so you're no longer feeling like you're on the outside. So you have volunteers that come in for the day. Is yes, that correct? we do have some daily volunteers and that role is individuals that come in and help us make camp programming better than it's ever been before. And mm-hmm. so our daily volunteers come in and they'll help maybe teach a class, do our science lessons, do um, an arts and crafts lesson or come in and run a program that we've never had before. We had yoga last year and they've had yoga a couple times in the past. And I just think that's the coolest thing ever, especially cool. for our campers. And then we have some daily volunteers that see a need that most people don't want to do, aka house cleaning. <laughs> well, I mean, you got to, you know, like, yeah, you got to take the take the, the, the good the with not, the bad yeah, kind not, of thing, right? <laughs> just right. the smelly sheets with the um, sparkling clean water. <laughs> absolutely, right. absolutely. So, um, where where's the camp physically physically located? Where where do the campers go to? 
Yeah, so I'm sure you guys have heard of Camp Grace. It's mm-hmm. located okay. in Westmobile, um, where I, it's a multi-use facility in the sense that we are absolutely not the only camp that uses it. Um, but what makes Camp Grace as a facility stand out is, first off, the staff is incredible. Um, they go above and beyond to make sure each camp that's there, which um, all the camps cater to children or adults with special needs in some way or another, they go above and beyond to make sure our needs are met. And they are kind and welcome and gracious and open arms. Because sometimes, you know, we have our families, our campers come in and they need an extra, extra special request. They never roll their eyes. They never make it a big deal. And it's just, it truly is. I mean, they say Disney's the most magical place on earth, but like, I apparently they've never been to Camp Grace. Yeah. That's, That's yeah, all I got to yeah. say. Disney copying Camp Grace. I mean, really, sure. I think probably if you go back far enough. <laughs> So let's go back a little bit. We were talking before the show started, and you're from Osage City, Kansas. Yeah, that is correct. Right. So if anybody can find that on a map, let me know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she told me where it was. And yeah. Yes, yeah, somewhere so, in that rectangular state up there to the north, kind of. <laughs> so first it snows up there. It does get hot up there sometimes, but it yeah. snows up there. There's a lot of flat land. Yeah, absolutely. There's, a few, there's a few lakes. Mm-hmm. And there's some rivers. How did you end up? On the Gulf Coast of Alabama in, in Mobile. You're absolutely, well, first off, you know, you didn't name beaches for a reason. We were very <laughs> middle of the country there. We really saw an opportunity, my boyfriend and I, to get out and explore something new. And we kind of had our top five places picked. And Mobile was not on that list originally. We just couldn't pass up a great opportunity to be somewhere we've never been, live near the ocean, live near beaches. We can travel over to New Orleans, which is really fun and cool. Yep. Just see a different part of the world with a different different group of people. It happened to be when we moved down here that this position was available, and it was like a bullseye to the wall sort of thing. It just screamed at me, and I'm so happy that we ended up here because I don't know if it would have ended up any other way. So what was it about that job that attracted you? Yeah, I actually have some experience. When I was in high school, I was a counselor at a camp very similar up in Kansas, and it was specifically for children with spina bifida. And I had no idea, you know, when I was 16, that that would end up being such something that's still so impactful to me today. But I uh, was in a position before where I was able to work with people from all over the country. And it was so inspiring to me to hear these different stories and these different paths. And I moved down here. I saw an opportunity to be of service. I saw it was something I'd kind of done before. And I saw it as an opportunity to get out there and make, a, you know, impact from the ground up. I mean, you look at it where... There are so many ways we can change things by looking at red tape or talking about the bigger picture. But then we, I think, sometimes lose sight of the small picture or lose sight of where we can help physically and hands on. Well, so you were a counselor, obviously, and you work with, a, with, with hundreds of counselors a year. So mm-hmm. what are some qualities that make the perfect camp counselor in your in your opinion, I mean, who like you see this person, you think, all right, that's, that's who we need. We need, we need yeah. more of this person. I love that question because uh, we also have to do an interview process for our camp. We're an ACA accredited camp, and we would do it anyway, but it's one of those requirements. And that's actually one of the questions we ask our potential counselors. We say, what about you or what skills do you have would make you a great counselor? And um, there are hundreds of things you could name, honesty, integrity, compassion, and those are all really true. But we want someone that when they're faced with a with a decision that they have to make in a, in a split second or you know, they're, they're faced with this decision and they're working in an environment they've never been in before, that when given two options, they pick the one they believe is most right and they ask for help if they need it. When it comes down to it, I, I believe knowledge is power, but you don't get knowledgeable without first submitting you don't know anything. Mm-hmm. And if you've never worked in this environment before, we don't say, okay, immediately go out there, be perfect, act like you've had 10 years of experience because that's unrealistic. That'll never happen. But if we have counselors that come to us and say, I am so excited, but I am scared. How do I do this? We say, that's great. That's what we need. <laughs> that's a great answer. I mean, yeah, that, that is very, very true. How do you raise money? I mean, it takes money to operate Camp Smile, right? So uh, You're not wrong. Um, it takes a lot of money. <laughs> but um, we first off are in a really supportive community, and we've been around for a long time. Um, way back in 1972, when camp kind of first became an idea, it was a little bit different than it's different now even. Our biggest funding definitely comes from our fundraisers and our donations and, of course, writing grants. With the with the impact of that community aspect, we reach so many people by, first off, serving the population that we serve, having families come, having a variety of counselor volunteers, and then um, the families that we impact in those different ways. So, like, we might have a parent of a counselor that says, I've heard of Camp Smile, and, you know— at, at my work, we are always looking to do a donation of a meal or we want to see what impact we can make. And they've got that a little earworm of Camp Smile from way down the line. And now all of a sudden they want to help out. And so 
we don't ask for just money. Um, we ask individuals in the community, if you want to give back and really be hands-on, you want to see the impact that you're making, come out and serve a meal. Get it catered, and but you be there behind the scenes serving that meal to those campers. And especially if you bring something everybody likes, you really get a lot of smiles. <laughs> So food's still important. That's good to know. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt, man. I mean, that's really why I took the job. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah. just really love Chick-fil-A four times a week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, There's worse things to eat. Yeah. Yeah. We have someone who would agree with you on Chick-fil-A right. seven times a week, possibly. <laughs> that is a unique. We got the first Chick-fil-A back in Kansas right before I moved down here. And I'm not even kidding. The line backed up traffic on like the biggest road in Lawrence. And then I moved down here and I was like, guys, there's Chick-fil-A everywhere. Did you know that? And there's a, there's a backup at all of them still. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Tell us, I, I assume you have some fundraisers yes. every year. Share, yes. Share um, we just finished up this last April, one of our uh, biggest funders. It's come to be one of our biggest fundraisers, and this is in its fourth year, so we'll be turning into our fifth the next. And um, if you've ever heard of Miles for Smiles, and it is our campaign, it was actually founded by our current director's husband, um, Jake, he was getting ready to turn 30 and really wanted to make an impact on the world around him, which I'm sure that there are other people that can relate to that. And so he founded this fundraiser where we, he and one other individual alone walked from New Orleans to Mobile or from Mobile to New Orleans the very first year. And he was very tired. So the next year we decided, all right, let's bring some teams on. Let's get some other people involved. And so now we have 10 teams that walk 13.7 miles and we either go from Mobile to New Orleans or from New Orleans to Mobile and those teams together raise funding for us. And so they'll go out there and say, because you don't want to walk 13.7 miles, I am, but I would love some money for this organization that I'm doing it for. That fundraiser alone is to turn around and give camperships to our camp. Our campers, for everyone that attends, we we want to welcome anybody, any walk of life, any issue, in any um, financial situation. And so we offer camperships that um, help lessen that burden sure as you can imagine when you have a child with special needs or a disability it does make it um, a little bit more expensive obviously and so we want to turn around and say we're not going to be another thing on your plate we're actually going to be the thing that takes something off your plate and makes it a little bit more free for you so miles for smiles is certainly one of our biggest biggest fundraisers and we do a fundraiser in the um, fall as well and it is the for greenery where you can buy christmas greenery so think in garlands and wreaths and that sort of thing and um, it's really fun because it might not be as big or as well known, and especially since I don't think it gets as cold down here. It's still really fun to see Christmas decorations. People have a little bit of camp with them at that point, and they can look at it and say, you know, that wasn't just a wreath, that wasn't just a garland, that actually helped send a kid to camp, that helped provide food for a child at camp. If someone wanted to volunteer, what are the qualifications and what what, what does that process look like to be able to either be a counselor or a come serve a meal or come for the day? Yeah. Um, and what are your needs in, in that regard? Absolutely. So as of today, so right now, our biggest need is male counselors. We have had a very great blessing in the number of female counselors that we've had apply this year. And it's incredible to turn out. But um, guys kind of drag their feet maybe a little bit more. Maybe they're a little bit more scared. I'm here to tell you, don't be scared. Uh, give me a call. I'll walk you through it, whatever you need. And they can apply online. And that's the same for um, any counselor. So looking into the coming years, we have an online application. It's really pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Mm-hmm. And we're looking for account- overnight counselors for our campers 16 and older. So we're a little bit younger than some of the other camps in the area. Um, that comes with some, it, you know, a little bit more attention is paid mm-hmm. to by our unit leaders, which are over our counselors, since they do tend to be a little younger. But it gives them that sense of responsibility at a young age to give back and to, to get involved, which is really exciting. We get a lot of calls from parents that say, I really want my kid to do this. What do I have to do? And then they come back on their own without a parent even being involved. They want to keep coming back, like we said. And then as far as meals go or, or direct donations, um, give us a call. Send mm-hmm. me an email. Even if it's something that you have been kind of playing around with, like, what can I do? I would rather just talk you through it and let you know this is what we're looking for. And it's easier than it sounds. Because like I said, we have some people, organizations that come out and they bring a bunch of cans of green beans and they bring some spaghetti and they bring some sauce and they make it right there on site, which is so cool. But you don't have to do that. If that's like, I already burn things in my own kitchen. Don't make me come to your giant kitchen with giant cans of green beans. Um, Get it catered. You know, have someone come out, um, pay for the meal on catering. And then come out and hang out with us. And a meal catered is generally about $1,500. And um, when you look at it, for some people, that's a really big number. For some people, that's not a lot, which is awesome. But we also have four weeks of camp. So our need for meals is huge. And that's truly why it's one of our biggest needs. Wow. You've got all these counselors. Mm -hmm. You're you're doing all this training and stuff. And so there's a lot of times where you're leading, coaching, mentoring, guiding. I hope so. A lot of, (laughs) of, of young people. 
Tell me more about that part of your role. Yeah, gladly. Um, So something uh, you might not know about me is I actually stepped into this role. This will only be my second summer at camp, but I 100% hit the ground running. I uh, didn't leave a stone unturned. I read everything I could about camp. I read about other camps like our camp. I read about other camps just in the area. And I took the time, I think, to do a lot of research because, as I mentioned before, knowledge is power, but you don't get that unless you're willing to ask questions and sit back. My biggest thing is I I can't stand absent listening. Don't, you know, get into a group or get into a situation, ask a question and just wait for them to get over so you can talk your part. You're not going to learn anything that way. And also the fact that you need to engage with don't don't just engage with that one person, get all aspects, engage from the ground up. I was um, I spent my first year really sitting back and listening to the ideas coming in and letting everyone else have a share at the table, because when it came down to it, regardless of my role, they had more experience. And you, you learn from those others' experiences and, and, you know, letting that help shape your role. And so now I feel much more comfortable uh, with the role that I've been given because I was able to take that path and take that time to listen and work with everyone that I worked with. Talk to the campers. I talked to the counselors. I talked to our unit leaders. And then I looked at our director and said, give me feedback. You know, and you can't be afraid of feedback. You can't be afraid of criticism. You can't be afraid of someone saying, that wasn't great, but here's how we can do it better. And that's also how I believe in giving feedback is you can't just tell someone what you did wrong and then not turn around and help them get better. Especially if, if there's someone you're working with or working for or, you know, the population you're serving because you're asking to get someone that's subpar in a role that needs someone that's great. I really try and relate to, to everyone I work with, and that's especially with our counselors. We clearly work with a lot of younger counselors. We have a lot of educators on our staff whenever we have summer staff. And it's so important to, to, to get on their level and just say, hey, like, listen, just tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you want to see. And what can we do to make that better? Or what can we do to make myself better? Yeah, that's great. Well, and so you have, I mean, you're impacting people every every day in a, in a very positive manner, obviously. So looking back on your life, mm-hmm. has there been a mentor in your, in your life or someone who's really had a, an impact on kind of your, I don't know, just your personal life or the way that you approach your, your job now? I, I was able to work with someone when I was in Lawrence that had a really interesting path in her life. And she is someone that helped shape me to, to kind of go into a role of service. And part of that came from, you know, we were, we were discussing work one day and money over power, over impact. And how do you kind of bring all those into one? Because those are real life questions that you can't shy away from. You can't be afraid of them. And she had a really good point of saying, you know, at the end of the day, what are you left with? Take everything else out. What are you? How do you feel? And that really helped me realize that um, at the end of the day, I want to be able to look in the mirror and say things aren't awesome all the time, but I, I have more great memories and I have more great experiences, and I have more times that I can point out that made a difference than than less. And that really helped me, you know, come along. And I've I've had a great support system in the fact that when I said, you know, I'm going to move across the country, when I said I was going to do psychology in college, um, I had a lot of support from people saying, you know, I think that's crazy, but whatever you need, I can do for you. I can be there to support you. And a lot of that just comes from the fact that I am never afraid to ask for help. I'm not afraid of, to say, I don't know what I'm doing. Help me out here. Because I, I, there's no sense in being embarrassed and saying, I've never done this before. Mm-hmm. I don't have to be an expert in anything. And really, I feel like you end up looking like more of a doofus if you try and walk around like you do know everything. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I'll, I will quote that at some point. Yeah, don't look like a doofus. <laughs> I'll um, write it down for you. <laughs> <laughs> what are, are you a reader, podcaster, listener, podcast listener? What are, what are you, oh what's, what's your chosen choice of media? I would say right now, number one podcast. I don't even like listen to the radio anymore. I, I don't even know what's on top 40. Um, I am podcast, podcast, podcast. So, so what are some good, well, yeah. good ones? Yeah. So start today, I listen to Up Next, NPR's podcast about the okay. news. I think it's very important to stay, um, at least, you know, keep an ear to the wall on politics or what's going on in the country and how that affects you, even if it's just a tiny bit. I think it's fun to, to stay involved and see what's going on. And then another one that's a little bit more easy listening, but so interesting to me is um, it's out of Radio Lab in North Carolina, and it's criminal. And this woman uh, does this podcast, they're shorter form, but she goes into all these different aspects. It, it sounds like it might be all about like true crime or whatever, but it's actually just how these different aspects of crime might impact a community. And one that she did that I thought was so thoughtful was a, a poisoning of a tree in Texas that's so well known to the community and how in the end it just brought the community together to save it. And so there's there's these different aspects of things that you're like, oh, I never would have thought about it that way. And I think it just really kind of opened my mind to the idea of, oh, I, I, that's something I never would have thought of. And now I'm interested in it. And then I find myself reading like a 10 page article on it. And I'm like, all right, where'd the, where'd the time go? Why do I do this to myself? <laughs> 
music? All right, so I am obsessed with Fleetwood Mac. That is probably my number really? one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know. Right. I actually saw rumors downtown at, um, oh, I can't even remember where they were downtown, and it was just a blast, They're like a tribute band, and I, I could not go see them in New Orleans, and it was heartbreaking. So if I'm cooking, I love to cook. That's my number one. Okay. Always okay. in the okay. kitchen. Yeah. It's the perfect thing to turn on in the background. Just throw that on. It's a little bit of classic rock, I guess, is how you how you describe that. Um, that's definitely my number one. A little Bob Seeker in there. Mm-hmm. Favorite meal to cook. Well, anything for other people. I love having I love having an audience. I love having guests over. I love entertaining. I just think that um, turn the phones off, sit down, enjoy a meal, tell me about your day, tell me something interesting. I read this article, what do you think? And doing that over a meal is, is really the best way to do it. So if I'm going to cook a meal, I really, I mean, I want it to be full of carbs. I want it to be full of fat. I want it like a whole stick of butter. That's what I'm looking for. So anything that combines those three. That's oh, please, why you like anytime. New Orleans. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I am a, I am always looking to try something new. So I'm like, oh, let's go to this nice restaurant. Let's go to this one. And at the end of the day, it's like, I can't walk, but it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, That's great. Molly, clearly your, I mean, your, your energy is contagious. And, and it, it's, it's very obvious that you love what you do. And, and the folks at Camp Smile are, are very, very lucky to, to have you on staff right. there. So as you leave us, I can't decide what question I want to ask, but I think I'll, I'll throw this one out. So you are driving back. Well, you actually... You live close here, so you're walking back mm-hmm. home. Wait, she yes. might be riding her bike. Back. Yeah, she's riding her bike, yes. bike back. <laughs> so you're riding back down to your condo, your house, your apartment, and the spaceship lands on the, in the middle of the street, blocks your way. You can't can't get past. The little door opens. Alien comes down the walkway and says, "Molly, take me to your leader. Where would you take the little green fella?" Well, I'm um, I'm also a bargain hunter, so I think I'd take a two for one deal, and I'd say, "Take me to my dad. He's." A pretty special guy, but also I get a trip home to Kansas, and you can't beat that, right? I, I'm oh, assuming I could nice. go along to show him where I'm going. Oh yeah, yeah, you got yeah, to be yeah, a guy. Yeah, yeah. So like a little two for the one. Spacecraft, yeah. There you go. And then I, you know, I'm gonna say, hey, this is this is where I'm at right now. And then they're gonna be like, I'm sorry, I thought you went to Mobile. Tell me more about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That is great. Well, thank you for your time, Molly. It's been a pleasure. This has been awesome, guys. I can't thank wait you. to um, see what happens here. Please visit Camp Smile's website at www.campsmilemobile.org. Well, thanks for listening to our podcast today. To never miss an episode, subscribe to Playing Above the Line at iTunes and anywhere else you get your podcast. And be sure to leave us a rating. We'd love to know what you think about our show. To contact us or to stay connected, follow us on social media at HBKCPAS on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thanks for listening.